So hello everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Kiriakidis. I work in the renewables team at the Energy Saving Trust and welcome to today's webinar um, where we're going to be focusing on eco-homes and passive house homes. Um, the webinar is part of a series of webinars we're delivering. The work's funded by the Scottish Government as part of their support for home renewables and energy efficiency and that support is basically there to help lower Scottish householders energy bills and carbon emissions um, but also help meet climate change targets and build a lower carbon economy in Scotland. Um, firstly, some general points about the webinar. You can hear us, but we can't hear you, and that's perfectly normal for webinars, so don't be alarmed. Um, we expect the webinar to last approximately 45 minutes. Um, you can ask questions at any time through your control panel, which you should be able to see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we we'll, should have an opportunity at the end um, to answer questions um, and we also want to hear your views and we've got a poll in the middle of um, Alan's presentation so get your voting fingers ready. Um, we're also recording the webinar and we'll circulate it to you afterwards so you can watch it back. And onto the program for today, well firstly we've got Alan Budden who's the Director of Eco Design Consultants. He is uh, a passive house designer and um, he's going to talk to us about super efficient homes from an architect's perspective. After that we're going to go over to Sally Campbell who's a member of the Green Homes Network and a proud homeowner of an eco home and she's going to be sharing her experiences of transforming a home um, including with renewable technologies. So, without further ado, um, I'll pass you over to Alan. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Anthony. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me now. Um, as Anthony said, I'm, a, I'm an architect who uh, is specialised in passive house uh, and low energy buildings. So, here we go. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, the first slide I'd like to talk to you about really is our, what we call our eight points of comfort which goes through a number of key principles that we do with all our projects um, to help make the house as comfortable as possible and as healthy as possible. So the first point which I think is, is relatively um, well understood is to reduce heat by putting lots of insulation. Um, in human terms that's kind of like putting a big jumper on or a big duvet over your house. Um, which I think is fairly well understood. The second point is to make sure that the heat loss is reduced, making sure your jumper fits well. Uh, it's no point really having uh, the lovely sleeping bag with a metal zip. That metal zip could easily sort of cause very uh, cold and discomfort. Um, exactly the same thing can happen with a building in terms of thermal, what we call thermal bridging, which is where heat is lost through a, a junction. Um, these are often structural things, particularly like I'm showing here um, with the foundation, where uh, insulation generally is fluffy and not structural. Um, so we need to buildings to stand up. So there's often clever details needed to make sure that the, the zips and the metal bits and the cold bridges are reduced. The third point which I think is one of our, our major points at the moment, is the shape. Um, it's a, a fact really that heat is lost through external surfaces. So on a house it would be through the walls, the floor and the roof. So the better ratio between floor area of usable space and external walls the better. Um, this is illustrated in the, in the diagram I'm showing you now. This takes uh, the same house and flat um, layout in two different buildings. So you've got the flat here and what we've done is we've opened it up to show where the heat is being lost. So in that mid floor flat it's being lost to the walls. So that's a fairly small area shaded in pink compared to the bungalow where you open that out and it's got a lot more surface area. So the heat loss area is 74 meters squared on the flat and 279 on the bungalow. So really what does that mean? So what we've done is we've done a little bit of um, number crunching to see how they perform. So on the graph below you can see that the mid-floor flat here has a heating demand of 2,000 kilowatts uh, per year. So that's the, that's the fuel bill for heating that apartment. Um, up here we have the bungalow which you can see is over double. 
that's purely down to the fact that it's got more surface area to lose heat. Uh, in terms of building regulations, both of those properties meet building regulations, uh, mainly because the building regulations doesn't take into account the shape of the building. Uh, I think there's a, some house builders lobby to make sure that didn't happen, but anyway, that's another story. Um, all this is, is part of a document that we helped to produce for the NHBC Foundation, uh, The Challenge of Shape and Form, um, which if you want to, it's a free download. Um, you can go onto the NHBC Foundation's website and find that document, download it. Um, I'd say it's a good read, that's because we helped to write it. Okay, uh, the next point after shape is uh, drafts. Um, I don't know if people know that um, if you meet building regulations, you can have what we call an air tightness of 10, which is how many air, air changes there are, yeah, how, uh, how many air changes are needed to keep the house uh, draft free. Um, the building regulation size is approximately having a window of that size left open throughout the year to allow uh, air in and out, and that is what's um, allowable under building regulations. Obviously, it's not a good thing to have a whole lot of that open in your house. It would obviously be very cold, but that is what is, is probably happening to a lot of your, your houses at the moment. So what do you want to do about that? So looking at ways to reduce drafts is basically to try and make the building as airtight as possible. If we take our energy build-up, don't worry too much about the, the colors on the screen, but um, on the, the left side, we've got listed all the losses. On the right side, all the gains. So we've got a heating demand. We've got some internal gains and some solar gains. So what's important is the big bit on red. So that's the losses. So on a, a house built to building regulations with uh, an air tightness of uh, with 10 air changes per hour, that's how much is being lost. So if we then move on to the second slide, it's a passive house, which is a very high air tightness of 0.6. Um, which is obviously quite a lot lower. You can see that that red section has, has reduced greatly. Um, uh, and you can see now the heating demand has gone from 66 down to 14. That's a huge difference. And all that, all, all that is being achieved just purely by cutting out all those drafts, basically closing that big window that we saw on the, on the, first, on the previous slide. Um, and on the house I'm going to show you later, what we achieved was 0.07, so even less um, losses through drafts. So that reduced the heat load down to 11, so even much more efficient to heat. Okay, so the next point, once you have a warm, cozy house that's very airtight, obviously you need to have some form of ventilation. Um, that could be achieved by opening windows, it could be achieved by trickle vents. Um, but the way that we like to do things is with what we call a mechanical uh, MVHR, mechanical heat recovery and ventilation. Um, that's a picture of the device on the screen. Um, they're fairly large and have very large ducts. Basically what it does is it brings in fresh air from the outside into the, into the device and then it provides fresh air through into your habitable spaces. This air is then extracted in your wet areas, your kitchens and bathrooms, back into the device and out. And the, the, what happens then is the stale air passes next to the fresh air coming in and the majority of the heat is transferred from one to the other. In fact, up to 92% of the heat can be retained within the building using this type of system. Uh, so it's very effective. So hopefully that makes some sense. And it's, it's also the other great advantage with the MVHI is it's a filter there. So it actually filters out a lot of the pollen pollution and the pollen and all sorts of other things. Uh, the sixth point of our principles is to have good windows. Windows are incredibly important. They do a lot of things from letting in light and daylight to stopping heat escape and letting solar gain from the sun in. Um, one of the things that we would always recommend to people is to go for triple glazing. It's much more affordable than it used to be. Um, and a good tri triple glazing can make a huge difference. Um, one of the things that the body can do is it can detect the difference between four degrees between surface temperature and air temperature. So if your glass is less than four degrees in the surface temperature, you will feel a draft coming from that glass. It won't actually, it will be air movement, but it won't be a draft draft. It will just be because of the, the uh, heat moving the air. Um, so what we're 
because if you go for triple glazing with with good with the argon gas and low E coatings, then you can ensure that 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 glass temperature will never get that low. So you'll never have any problems of drafts and air movement from the windows, and also you won't have any problems with condensation or anything like that forming on the glass, or at least not on the inside. You may, on some very cold days, have condensation forming on the outside because the temperature is, is, is so good and so, so low on the outside that condensation can form, but never on the inside. Okay, looking at windows a little bit further um, is the ratio between frame and glass. This is again another very important factor of the, of the window. Obviously the, the glass is letting in light and letting views out but uh, and it's usually fairly efficient but the frames usually aren't as efficient thermally as the glass and they're not letting in the solar gain so reducing the amount of frame is really important. Um, we have a little poll coming up in a moment and what I'd like you to do is to have a go at thinking how much of that window you're, you're seeing there is uh, frame and how much is glass. What percentage is the frame? Um, what we'll do when we move it to the pole, the, the, the picture will disappear, but then you'll have choices from 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and 60%. So if you can think of your numbers now, we'll then move over to Anthony, who will run the poll, and we can see what people think. Okay, Anthony. Okay. And we put the poll up. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, as Alan said, just pick what you think the frame makes up as a percentage of the whole window. Most people have voted now. A few stragglers. Give them a quick moment. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm just going to close the poll and share the results. So hopefully you can see the results there. Okay, so nobody voted for 20% wisely. We had 16% of people voting for 30% 30 of the window. We had just over about a third of people voted for 40%, another third voted for 50%. And then about the same voted for a 60% coverage as well. So, um, yeah, 60% coverage. So we'll pass back to Alan to tell us what the right answer is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, the, if, if we look at the glass, what we've done here is we've done a quick movement of the glass up to the top corner so to try and help understand the area of the glass a bit further. And I think, probably, I think from what you're saying, 50% sounds about right from what people were saying, between 40 to 60%. So uh, that, that sounds good. So yes, it's quite surprising when you start looking at these things how much frame is really there. So the more you can reduce the frame, the better the window will perform. Um, and it's probably be a cheaper window as well to buy, but you do need to be careful to make sure you still have an openable window and the openable size isn't, isn't too big because obviously the hinges and so forth can't, can't cope with too big a window. So we, we generally talk about a 1.2 meter by 1.2 meter window as being the biggest. Okay, so thank you for that one. Um, keeping a, another look at that, so this is a, a, a slide I, I, I've used for my university teaching um, to architecture students. So on here we have um, three typical window um, arrangements. So type A, just one large pane, type B, two windows, and type C, the window with a top light for ventilation. Uh, quite a traditional window in the 80s. Um, so, oh, so giving away the clue, answers there. So what I'd like you to do now is I've got another poll. Um, this time we would like to decide how much heat loss, how much better worse performing is window B and window C um, compared to window A. Okay, so what do you think, guys? Do you want to, Anthony, do you want to take over the poll again? I, I'd love to, Alan, but the, the poll isn't there. Um, okay. So I'm just going to have to explain it to us, please. Okay, fair enough. That's fine. <laughs> okay, the answers are window B is 13% more losses and Window C is 32% more losses. So you can see how big a difference it makes to, to design your window as well. Okay, so the next point, and oh, by the way, uh, this is all in another NHBC 
um, document on Windows where we've done some interesting um, calculations on, on, on Windows and on how, how best to design them and what size it should be best. One very interesting finding from it was that um, if you've got a house that's overheating um, and one of the best ways of stopping overheating is to move from double glazing to triple glazing, which sounds like it should be the wrong thing to do, but actually what it does is it reduces the solar gain, so it reduces the overheating. It doesn't affect your daylighting because you're still getting the light coming through and it actually imp it improves your heat loss during the winter and so it makes it so it's a win-win-win situation. So go for triple. Point seven um, we're looking at here is once you've got your house you obviously want to make sure it's comfortable in summer and you don't want it to overheat and get too hot which is kind of what I just spoke about. Um, the basic principle here is that in summer the sun is nice and high and in winter the sun is lower. So we can use that and we can very easily put on a little extension on, these, on the front of the building to reduce the, the sun's rays into the building in summer and but it also will allow the lower winter sun to come in. So that's a very good way of doing it, a bit like a, a sun hat. And obviously we also, with passive houses, it's very important that you do open your windows. Um, there is some mis people misbelieving that you don't have open windows in a passive house, but that's not the case. You do open windows to let it to cool in summer and also if you, if you need to open it because you've got a smell or burnt the toast or whatever. Okay, and point eight is, is really uh, additional to passive house, but it's something that I think is important is then making sure that the materials you pick within your house have low or no VOCs, that that's volatile organic compounds that put out um, chemicals into the air uh, that aren't good for your health. So if you can avoid those, all the better. Um, the ventilation system with the MVHR is very good because it will circulate the air and make sure the air is, is taken out. So it is better than probably what's called natural, which is more down to random um, air in and out. Okay, so just moving on to the next part of the presentation now is what is Passive House? So taking those principles, we put it together to make Passive House. The main thing with Passive House is that it has a specific heat demand of 15 kilowatts per square meter per year. What that means is that's the amount of kilowatt hours needed to heat the building per square meter of usable floor space per year. Um, a typical building to building regulations now is about 80, 80 80 kilowatts per hour, a passive house is down to 15. What that means is that also allows you to be able to heat the building using the MVHR system if you wish to um, without overventilating. So the second principle here is obviously super insulation. These have U values which is the thermal losses through the elements of less than 0.5 with no cold bridging. It's obviously then we say it's got to be airtight so there's no drafts with an air tightness of less than 0 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. It has to have an efficient ventilation um, MVHR system, ventilation system. This ideally should be a passive house certified unit, uh, otherwise you have to have a penalty taken out of your calculations if you don't use a certified unit because there's been I think some mis uh, mis-selling in terms of the, the, the results and stuff the passive house industry have found. Um, the fifth thing is good solar orientation. So ideally, you should orientate your building to south um, and take advantage of those solar games. It's not everything. It's, it's about a third of the heat loss, heat um, gains. So it's not everything, but it's, it is still useful to do that. And it's particularly useful to try and orientate south to help shade out the summer sun because the sun is at the highest when it's on the south. Um, all that basically provides a very comfortable internal living. With, with surface temperatures less than four degrees different from the external side. So it, it becomes a much more comfortable house with good ventilation, good air quality. It, it, it's, it's, I must recommend that it's worth visiting a passive house if you ever get a chance. Um, it's something that you can't really put your finger on until you've visited one. Um, and then on top of that, it's basically a, a requirement to make sure the total energy isn't more than 120 kilowatts. It's relatively simple to to achieve that as long as you don't go silly with your appliances and your lighting and other things. So that's an overall check just to make sure you don't go silly on other, other items. Uh, passive House is a proven technology. What's happened is over the last 25 years since Wolfgang Feist and his team have been developing Passive House, they've done a lot of monitoring. Um, each of those bars on that screen is a, is a, is a, is a house on, a, on a, an estate in Germany, I think this one is. And 
you can see the difference between the predicted and the measured um, energy rates. And all of them are below the 168 kilowatts per Kelvin, which means that they all are meeting the passive house requirements. So it's shown to actually happen. Um, a lot of the SAP calculation stuff haven't come true in terms of what they predicted. It's also affordable. Um, as you increase your in air, air tightness, insulation, and windows, things do go up in price. But by the time you get to passive house, you can then reduce what you need for your conventional heating system. You can just put a, a simple ventilation system in the um, system to heat, heat it, or, or, or simple radiator. Or, very small systems needed. Um, overall, when you start looking at the cost, the initial cost is more, but the, the maintenance cost is, is slightly less, I believe, and the heating costs are obviously much reduced. So possibly for a 10% increase in capital cost, um, you will get a great building and it will, will become the cheapest overall solution, particularly if you can then sort of see how much you would pay for that additional comfort, which is something that is very difficult to put price on. So yeah, here we go. That's a picture of some you can sit near the window so you can use the whole house and you don't need to have radiators put under your windows anymore you can put your radiators wherever you like or your heating system wherever you like so passive house is also healthy this is a, a slide that, and some information that tesla have done recently they've got their tesla car and they've put it into a biodome and they filled it with lots of nasty gases um, biochemicals and stuff and inside the car they've got a, a system that will filter the air and provide fresh air to the, the occupant and so that the occupant is really safe and okay and over time it was shown that actually the air outside was getting better because the, the, it was filtering the, the air in the outside as well and I got to think that this is really what we're talking about in passive house as well so we're basically making it draft free so that none of those nasty gases can come in and then we're filtering the air so it's a slightly um, finer filter that the Tesla has, but there's no reason why you couldn't put that in your house. So it does show that actually it's a much healthier um, thing to do. Uh, just a quick slide there. This passive house is all um, calculated using a big spreadsheet. Um, and there's a couple of slides, pictures there from the, from the, from the um, Excel spreadsheet, and lots of numbers have to be filled in just to show you what to do. So just to quickly compare passive house to other standards. So building regulations has probably a kilowatts per square meter of between 60 and 85, 90. Um, the reason it's not a precise figure is like I said before, it's the shape of the building isn't taken into account in building regulations. Um, passive house is then down to 15, so you can immediately see that huge savings to be made in terms of fuel use and CO2 savings. Um, and then another standard that you could go for is the ACB Silver, which is at 40 kilowatts per square meter, which may be an option um, if, you, if you need to, um, which is better than the, the building regulations, and also maybe an option if you're looking at retrofit. Okay, so this is a few pictures of some passive houses. So that's a passive house in Howard Park in Milton Keynes that we designed. There's a retrofit project in Nottingham. We've got uh, another retrofit project in Bedfordshire. Um, the house just shown there is a, is a full certified passive house down in London, retrofit of a Victorian terrace. Um, a lot of work needs for that one. We have a passive house there in um, Derby, which is slightly didn't meet the, the air tightness requirements and so isn't, isn't certified yet, but it's still a very low energy building. And at the bottom, we have a uh, recently completed passive house we've just done in Bedfordshire with a full roof PV. So it's actually a passive house plus. We're just waiting for certification to come through on that one. Um, like I said, you can also do passive house for retrofits. So if you guys have got any retrofits you're looking at, um, these are some of the buildings and some of the details needed. It's a lot more complicated because you need getting it, particularly getting it airtight is much more difficult, but it is possible to get to a very low energy requirement. The benefit standard is actually slightly lower than the 15 kilowatts per square meter for passive house is actually 25 and the airtightness rather than being 0.6 is one. So it's slightly easier but it's still a very exacting um, standard to get to. Um, and then we have what's been recently introduced by the Passive House Institute in Germany is the Eurofit standard, which is a horrible name, but basically it's the retrofit in stages because what's been found is that people can't afford to do the full retrofit in one go. Uh, the London retrofit there was £150,000. So it's not always the sort of money that people have to spend on these buildings. So you might want to do it over 
over a period. So it, using the Eurofit the Euro standard, you can set in place a plan of action to meet the, to the full standards in the end, which might take you 40 years, and you can then split it into sections and get a certificate on the way for each of those stages. And then also, if you then sell the house, you can then sell it with the plan and the, the, the things you can do to it to make it uh, better and get to the final year of fit standard. One of the reasons for doing this was it's quite tempting to, if you haven't got the money, is to do what we call a shallow retrofit. So just putting a little bit of insulation on it, just make it a little bit airtight, doing some minor things. So you can see on this slide, the, the red uh, numbers are the shallow retrofits and the yellow are the deep retrofits. So as we move down the different different stages of the of the of the retrofit. So you just first of all you've got the existing building, we then maybe put in windows and ventilation system. So again we're going much further on the deep retrofit. And then we maybe do the basement ceiling and the roof and PV, go a bit further, and then we put the external wall insulation, maybe an entrance door, and then finally we replace the heating system and, and get to the the um, uh, and if it's standard. But what you can see is if you do a shallow retrofit, you get locked in. You can't go much further. So at the end, you may be having a heat demand of 72 rather than 25. So that's quite a big difference. So what we are suggesting is that you do plan for the future. You make a plan for your house and then you take it in stages and you do as best as you can each of those stages. So you may be doing less in one go, but you, you plan it and, and, and make sure you can get there in the end. Okay, just moving on. This is a quick example of one of the passive houses that we've worked on. So this is Howe Park passive house in Milton Keynes. This is probably, the, it's, I think it is still the most airtight building in the UK. Um, I'm still waiting to hear from anyone who says, says otherwise. I haven't heard yet. Um, so what we did on that house was it was a timber frame. Um, we had very good U values there, which I won't quite go into and bore you with those at the moment. But you can see it's a timber frame. It's built with an I frame uh, timber stud. Um, stick built on site, so each of those pieces was pre-cut in the factory, and the top and bottom had a routed joint, so it, you, you put it in exactly where it needs to go, and every piece was fitted like a jigsaw. Uh, the idea with the web of the timber frame being thinner basically means there's less of a cold bridge, less heat being transferred from inside to outside. And then you can see on the outside a, wood, a breathable wood board that allows moisture to, to breathe in and out. Uh, this is the foundations. So on this one, basically, they dig a hole, um, put some hardcore down, leveled it off with some sand, and then basically there's a little brick plinth underneath the black insulation of the black membrane at the edge, which supports the outer, outer side of the wall. And then inside we put some load-bearing block, lightwork blocks that, that acted as a secondary support in case the insulation um, disappeared for any reason, which I'm sure it wouldn't, but we were being a bit cautious. So here you can see we put the insulation in. So this is a, a EPS insulation, a grey one, so it's an enhanced one. Um, so that was positioned around the load-bearing um, block work, which we didn't really need because the insulation would have done it, but it was just, like I said, a, a secondary um, precaution. Um, and then we basically, on top of that, put the membranes down and, and laid the concrete um, foundation for the ground floor. Um, one of the interesting details, as you can see around the edge here, this is where the patio doors went. On here, we put a glass reinforced plastic, a GRP angle, which was then going to be bolted into the concrete. And this then allowed the patio doors to sit onto the angle over the top of the insulation because there's, there's insulation underneath here, which is raised up to the edge. Okay, so the other important thing was the air tightness, which I said before. So that's basically how many when you pressurize the building, how many air changes from the house would go out at 50 pascals. So we've got requirement of 0.6, which is an average of um, negative and positive pressure. Um, that effectively means for a three bedroom house, um, a hole the size of a beer mat. Um, and then we achieved 0.06, which is the hole of the size of about 50 pence piece. Um, the air tightness was achieved through a number of uh, measures. Uh, on here we can see the OSB3 on the inside, which has formed the air tightness barrier on the inside, and some air tightness tapes, um, basically fixing everything together. And at the floor junctions, again, a lot of air can be lost through where you, your floor 
joists fit into the wall. So again, we, the membrane was, was used to cover the, the junction between the ground floor and the first floor, and that again was taped in place. And this is the final house. And different view. You can see on this, we've got a very large overhang, to this, this is the south elevation, large overhang on the south side to shade out some of that summer sun. You can see on this, on this um, spring day, um, it's shading a lot of the, the windows at the top. And that's a side view. And the, the rear. And inside. So this is a, a large open plan house. It's three stories. Um, and you can see on the right here, this is the heating system for the house. So basically, we have a, a electric panel heater uh, that will heat the house. Um, that, along with three tower rails, one in each bathroom upstairs. Um, most of the heat obviously coming from the windows. So a third of the heat of the house always coming from the, from the windows, about uh, another third from people and another third from the heating. Okay, thank you very much. So that's my presentation done. Hopefully you've got some interesting questions for me to, to discuss with you later. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, we're going to move swiftly on to Sally Campbell, who's going to talk about her own eco home. Over to you, Sally. Thank you. Okay, unmuted. Okay. Um, hi. So, um, that was such an impressive uh, conversation that we just had with Alan and listening to Alan that um, I sort of feel kind of like I have very little to say. We uh, used to live, we lived for a period in the 1980s in New Zealand. And at that stage, we discovered all sorts of things about environmental facilities that you could put in a home. So when we came back to Scotland, we decided we would try to find a way of doing that if it was going to be at all possible. We found this little bungalow um, that you can see um, in 2013, and we were able to purchase it. Um, it was originally built in the Scandinavian style, so it meant it had no internal load-bearing walls, which was a delight, um, because it meant you could rip out all sorts of things. Um, and it's set in a part of Edinburgh which is very uh, green, so it has a large garden round about it and lots of trees. Let's see if I can go to my next slide. So we decided to get um, an architect that was local here in Edinburgh and told him that we wanted, we had two main requirements. One was that we would sink a bore to have geothermal heating throughout the house, something that we learned about in New Zealand. And also, obviously, we wanted PV cells on the roof. And every so often I kept saying, well, maybe we should have some wind power and he would sort of throw up his hands in horror and say, goodness, what happens to my lovely design? But um, we also, um, so those, those things were added to the house. Um, in terms of living here, it becomes really very, very easy and very cheap because the house is actually cost neutral. By the time we have the uh, little bit of money that you get from the PV cells, and also um, you get rebate from the Renewable Heat Initiative. Um, this means that essentially our costs of running the house are taken care of. Um, yeah, so I think for us the absence of gas <laughs> was really very, very important. We didn't really want to have to use any more uh, natural resources if we I could avoid it. So we ended up with something that is very open plan, as you can see, and um, very um, environmentally healthy, um, but probably not as healthy as a passive house. 
Um, we added the um, wood burner, I think primarily for um, effect, um, but then we had this huge pine tree in the garden that came down. It went the entire length of the garden. And so once we started getting that chopped up, we realized that we probably have enough wood that we will do all of our wood supply and probably two other houses for at least a year. It's a, it was a huge tree. So uh, we're going to be using up this, this wood. And um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I can't give you all these technical specs, but all of our heating is, is under floor. And it, H room has its own uh, temperature control, so it enables us to have um, heat at one level in each one of the bedrooms. We presently have three bedrooms and the next slide, a tatami mat room. Now we decided on the tatami mat room because we had lived in Asia for a number of years, 10 years actually. And um, two of our young people were our children were living in Japan, and we quite fell in love with this way of living, mainly because the tatami mat room gives us the opportunity to have a bedroom, but also our own space, um, another space that means we can have a quiet area, we can read, we can paint, we can do anything. Um, the room at the very end, if you look out through this door, what you're doing is you're looking across the corridor, across the deck, and that very last room that you see there is my husband's study. So this means that he can be in there and I can be in the tatami mat room, and I think that's very wonderful. We can meet at the kitchen or someplace in between. But um, because we had underfloor heating, we had to have our, our tatami mats uh, specially made in Japan because uh, the tatami uh, reacts with underfloor heating and it had to have a special um, bonding of some kind put on the, um, on the underside of the mats. But it's a very, very comfortable space and we, we love it. As a matter of fact, our, our three young people generally fight with each other over who's going to sleep in the tatami mat room. Um, the other thing that we did was because we have traveled a, a fair amount in Japan, we ended up sourcing a toilet that has a water recycling system. So what it does is the water, the clean water that goes into the cistern is diverted into a little spout at the top of the cistern. It's an external spout and it goes into a basin which is again the top of the cistern and you can wash your hands there. So you use the toilet, you flush the toilet and then you just stand up and wash your hands as the fresh water flows into the basin and then it that water goes into the cistern and it's ready to use. Um, this is a, obviously it doesn't save a huge amount of water, but it is, is just another little recycling facility that we thought would be great fun. The Japanese have been making these sorts of toilets for many, many decades now. And, um, it's impossible to buy them here. At least I've never come across one. Um, so we managed to source that in Australia. And the Australians are embracing this because they have problems with water supply. Um, as you probably are aware, there is a huge number of droughts in Australia. So that's something else that we added to the house. I don't really know what else I can tell you about it, except that uh, we just find it very easy. Um, as a matter of course, about speaking about insulation, as Alan has just done, um, the way the architect was describing it to us, my husband just translated it as, he's just putting a little tea cozy on our house. That's essentially it. But 
as you've probably seen from the pictures, we had um, a completely new roof put on, and therefore they were able to add all the new type of insulation that would go into roof space. And the walls of the house that were built were very, very thick. I mean, they're probably about 15 centimeters or something. Um, I don't really know much about these. Uh, all the glass doors are, are um, I can go back. So the one door that you see next to the, um, the long uh, sideboard there, that's a sliding door. And there's another one on the other side of that. Um, uh, it, it's actually called an altar. It's from China. But it, it, that sideboard. So there are two sliding doors there. And then the two fixed panels where there's in the middle of the wall on the other side of the house um, have two sliding doors at each end. All of these are double glazed. The only um, one that is triple glazed is the one, the corner room, the corner piece of glass that you see in this picture. Um, that's triple glazed because that room is actually our bedroom. Um, and so my husband was very adamant that we have triple glazing there to cut out any noise. But it's a very quiet area, so we don't get a lot of noise. Um, so that's the house. And it's really over to anybody to ask questions about it um, from that to this. And we think it's just been a wonderful thing to do. We feel really, really pleased that we've been able to have a house that in future will not require the use of gas for heating. Um, obviously, we have no gas in our cooking or anything else. So that's, I guess, all I have to say. It's back to you, Anthony. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, what I'm going to quickly do is just run through the, the support um, that you can get from Home Energy Scotland if you're thinking about doing something similar yourself. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll run on to some questions from, um, from some of the listeners we've had. Um, so um, Home Energy Scotland is um, a network of advice centres funded by the Scottish Government to give independent or impartial um, and high quality advice. And that advice is, is bespoke, so it's sort of um, tailored to your particular circumstances and requirements. And they'll cover everything from energy efficiency improvements and renewables onto other areas, including um, your own personal transport as well. Um, within those advice centers, there are some specialist advisors. And they can discuss any plans you've got or any questions you have about how to improve the energy performance of your home and they can they can also do that in your home as well they can come around and have a look at, um, and assess your home and, and go through things with you those are um, specialists uh, are based all the way across Scotland so we have people all the way up in Shetland right down to to um, specialists who will cover um, Dumfries and Galloway as well um, they can produce a report for you for your home and provide ongoing support and, and each year we support over 3,000 households with um, specialist advice um, and there's also financial support. So um, there's a number of different schemes that you may be eligible for. In Scotland, the Scottish Government provides an interest-free loan. Um, that's for up to £32,500 um, to cover renewables improvements and energy efficiency improvements. Um, and of, this obviously helps you with the initial costs of making changes to your home. Um, the UK Government, when it comes to renewables, can help um, with paying back some of the costs over time. So there's something called the feed-in tariff scheme, and that pays you for renewable electricity, and the domestic renewable heat incentive that pays you for renewable heating. Um, the difference, obviously, is that these are payments that you get and you keep. Uh, they're designed to help um, uh, make you, the costs more affordable 
The Home Energy Scotland loan obviously helps you with the costs at the beginning, and you pay those back over time. The feeding tariff scheme and the renewable heat incentive pay you back over a period of time after you've installed. Um, and there may be other schemes you're eligible for, hence the need to, to phone Home Energy Scotland to, to work, work through that. Um, there's also other um, things that you can access through Home Energy Scotland. There's the Green Homes Network, and Sally is, is part of that network. It's basically people who have done things and are happy to share their experiences of how they've done it. And we can also set up a visit. Um, if you're interested in going and visiting some of these homes, we can also contact those homeowners and, and arrange for you to go and visit them. Um, we also have um, Green Homes Network members who often speak at um, events that the uh, Home Energy Scotland advice centres are holding in, in, in local areas. And then they've, they've got online tools as well. So if, for example, you're interested in renewables, there's some renewables tools that you can use, including one helping you find installers and read reviews of those installers on our website. Um, and then, of course, there's all the online resources. So there's not only our website, but there's a self-build section on the Scottish Government's website. And there's obviously Passive House UK and numerous other um, websites if you're thinking about doing sort of deep retrofits and, and um, building a new home. So you can phone Home Energy Scotland. There's a, a free phone number. That's 0808 808 2282 to find out more. Um, and thought we'd quickly cover some questions that we've received in. So um, we had there's a couple of questions for Alan to do with sort of more um, things to do with health and safety. Um, first one was about Legionella risks with using a heat recovery system. And the other one that's sort of related to health is whether there's any studies comparing the health of passive home occupants with those of conventional homes, particularly with reference to respiratory disease. So, Alan, have you got any okay. information in those areas? Yes. Um, to start with, this, there's no risk of Legionella at all. Um, Legionella is a waterborne disease, so the MVHR is completely dry, um, so there's, there's no risk of that at all. Uh, in terms of the studies, there's, there is... Um, and it's mostly anecdotal to be honest, most of the studies on the PETA at the moment. There are, I believe, some studies going on at the moment um, looking at it, uh, but I haven't seen any results from it yet. Um, a lot of the anecdotal stuff has been great. I, I went to visit a PETA house school a little while ago, and we, we went up to the, the staff room, and one of the other visitors asked one of the teachers whether he'd seen any effect on health, and he, it was amazing to watch his, this chap's face, the teacher. He said he'd had a drawer full of inhalers since they'd moved into the new school, and they hadn't been out of his drawer once. Whereas in the previous school, he was the inhalers were coming out once or twice a week. Um, and I think the, the deputy head also said that the absenteeism had reduced greatly as well. Um, so th there was lots of sort of anecdotal things about the air being filtered and being the right amount of air. There's, there's some studies on the opposite side um, showing how people don't use trickle vents as they should. Um, I think it was something like 80% of people never alter their trigger rents, which I can quite believe. Um, and it's very much, and also showing that the CO2 levels in bedrooms and stuff is much higher than it should be in a, in a sort of a, a traditional um, house, uh, which can cause problems of um, uh, not sleeping well and, and sort of other, other issues. So it is... Kind of, there's, there's kind of lots of evidence, no real studies yet. I'm, I'm hoping there will be soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's great, Alan. Um, a question for Sally. Um, someone was asking if you got to hand what the heat loss is for the final building. Um, whether you have any sort of reference material sort of showing that. I'm sorry, I don't have anything like that. We. Um, have an environmental engineer who um, did all the work for us and it's it's actually something I'm glad that that question has been asked because having heard what Alan was talking about I think it would be very interesting to ask him to come back and do another assessment of all of these other factors that we never knew about um, so I'm sorry I can't answer that now but I hope in due course we will get that that's fine. Thank you, Sally. Um, there's a question about um, the likely effects of Brexit on standards for housing and availability of grants. I'll take that. Um, at the moment, we don't know what the 
what the outcome of Brexit will be in negotiations with the EU, so there's nothing we can really add to that. I think it's just going to have to be a, a case of wait and see. But what is in your control are the decisions you make about your own homes and, and um, how you want to live in them. So um, I, mean, I guess recommendation there is, you know, we can help support you in, in doing things now. Um, to improve the comfort of your home and, and obviously you know the, the, the more energy efficient it is there I guess the less you'll be paying on your on your fuel bills um, uh, some questions for Alan um, probably take a couple more um, one is about overheating is is this a potential problem um, in um, very um, airtight homes and how, how is it managed um, I think part of that question I think was it was about with Scotland um, obviously it's up in Scotland, it is, it is, it is cold, colder than it is down here, um, but it is still a risk um, of overheating. Uh, so we, we do need to, to do that. Uh, uh, the, the other part of that question, I think, was about double glazing and triple glazing, because some people would say you want to use double glazing on the south facade and triple glazing on the north facades, where you can let slightly higher solar gains um, happen on the on the south side. Uh, that is true, and there are other glass specifications you can do to try and maximize the solar gains, but you do need to be careful not to not to overglaze. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, architectural thoughts, um, particularly for the last sort of 10 years or 15 years, to put large amounts of solar um, spaces on, on houses to help heat them. It's a very risky uh, idea to do that because you'll find that you'll be losing lots of heat in winter and gaining lots of heat in summer. So that the the, the balance is, is, is difficult to achieve, so you want to try and have a, a really, relatively good balance of, of glassing, glassing in your house. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, and then someone's asked a question about whether you can use like wood fueled heating, like biomass or wood boilers in, in passive homes. Is it possible? How, how do you sort of account for that? Yes, you can. Um, we've put some a biomass uh, boiler in, in a couple of the retrofits. Um, to be honest, it's not something you need. It's probably more of a thing to have on a nice, uh, to uh, on a lot sort of Christmas morning to have a nice fire, and then it's more of your your thoughts of having a nice fire than, than actually needing one <laughs> or having it finding it that useful. Um, the main thing with that is to make sure that it's uh, room sealed. So that basically what that means is you have your wood wood fired stove has a flue coming in from the outside and it has fresh air coming in from the outside as well. What you don't want is to be having an open fire where you obviously then need to have fresh air coming into the building to, to supply the oxygen to, for the fire to work. So you make it a room sealed unit and there's, there's lots of those available. Um, but to be honest, you probably won't need one in a passive house. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, and then a uh, question for, for Sally. Um, what was the sort of, uh, sort of uh, rough cost of the sort of deep ret retrofit you made to your, your bungalow? Um, was, was that just in relation to the environmental features, the, the um, geothermal heating and the uh, PV cells? Um, it doesn't, the questioner doesn't, doesn't ask. So maybe right. for a because in okay, so we'll we'll take those out. Um, those altogether were probably in the nature of about twenty to twenty five thousand um, pounds. But overall, because we had um, we had a huge change, the there was only um, the garage and the room that I'm sitting in, which is the study, were the original. Everything else was newly added, so it was over four hundred thousand for the entire thing. But that includes the twenty-five and maybe thirty thousand for the environmental uh, features that we put in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time, so um, we we said forty-five minutes. We saw one fifty-five minutes, and I think that's just because there's so much useful information here. So um, conscious that people have to um, leave. So. I'm going to draw things to a close. Um, firstly, I'd like to to mention we've got some future webinars coming up. Um, so on the 12th of October, we've got one on renewable heating solutions. Um, beginning of November, we're focusing on historic and hard to treat homes and what to do, what the best things are to potentially do with them. 
Um, 23rd of November, we're going to be talking about smart homes. And in February, we're going to be doing one on energy storage. Um, you can find the details of these on our website. The, the link is there. Um, so finally, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Sally and Alan again for, for taking the time out to, to speak to us today. Um, and to everyone who joined us, um, who took time out of their day to, to listen in. Um, goodbye, and I hope you tune in for our next webinar. Thank you very much.